Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thank you again for being a part of the conversation. Paul Jobson and I are very excited that you are a part of this conversation and have been for the last, I think, 80-something episodes. It's just crazy. We're almost uh, at 100 episodes, but we are, and we've had some incredible guests, and today is no exception. Today, I have with me my good friend, my partner on coaching the bigger game. We've talked about this on the show quite a bit, and I'm excited to finally get Christian DeFree, DeFreeze, DeVries on the show with me. And uh, Christian, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Uh, trying to beat the heat a little bit, being inside. Uh, Phoenix is starting to approach its 112, 114 degree temperatures. So, uh, you know, doing a little work inside, getting ready for uh, the, the summer camp season and getting the teams ready for next fall. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, Folsom today, 103 degrees. So we're, uh, we're we're not excited about that either. I know that's like super that's like spring in Phoenix, but um, but we're uh, we're, we're going to we'll, we'll deal with it. We'll, we'll deal with it like we always do. So, Christian, you, you are now are getting ready for your 26th year coaching at uh, not at Paradise Valley, but you're currently at Paradise Valley community college coaching both the men's and the women's uh soccer teams and uh, you've done a whole lot more and you're doing a whole lot more than that so i want to let you just share your story uh how you develop your passion for soccer and leadership and really just how you got to be where you are today working at paradise valley working with me on coaching the bigger game and doing several other things as well well yeah but phil i think that the story goes back back to college it really it really does go back to college and you know we I don't want to get into the discussion about what I think is wrong with youth soccer right now, but I think there, there is a little bit about that. Um, back when I was a youth player, I, I kind of got burned out. Um, and, you know, and I, when I got burned out, I, I wasn't faced with what our youth are faced with now, which is, which really scares me a little bit. Um, so, you know, and that, that can be part of our discussion as we talk about this, but I just stopped playing soccer. Um, and my, in my, you know, my junior year in high or sophomore year in high school. And, and I didn't know quite what I was going to do. And I, I actually ended up running cross country and I enjoyed running cross country. Um, I was a kid that I actually didn't have an intention of going on to college. I, I don't think my parents were really pushing me to go on to college uh, because I didn't know where I was going to fit in the grand scheme of things. But through running cross country, uh, I was I was introduced to Adams State College and one of the premier cross country programs in the entire country. And I, I decided to go to college. And, and as I went there, I I actually found out that that was a good place for me um, because that's where I started to find myself. And so my first exposure to really like top notch coaches was was Joe Vigil. Um, I, I had one of the premier coaches in the country in any sport that I was listening to on a daily basis, uh, you know, pursuing excellence. It, it was his idea. Every day we'd meet in the classroom and he would talk about how do we pursue excellence in what we do and that we should always be chasing that idea of excellence. And, and he would talk to us through, through stories, but he would also talk to us about why we're doing what we're doing. And I think that's really important when we start talking about this idea of, of coaching, how many of us as coaches are talking with our players about why you're doing what you're doing? What is the reason behind the message that you're giving or what you want them to do what you want them to do? And when we, when we, I thought that was real, real impactful as having that influence as that coach from him. Um, fast forward a little bit. I, I only ran my freshman year and I got, I got the, I got the knack for wanting to play soccer again. And so I helped start the club soccer team at Adam state college. And I played uh, through there. I ended up finishing my bachelor's degree. I went on to my master's team at Adam state. And I kind of got this niche that what I, what I really want to do is I want to be involved in college athletics and, and what's that going to look like now, I'll be honest with you, Phil, I didn't think coaching was the route I was initially going to go. I just wanted to be involved in college athletics and, and working with college athletes because that's where I found myself and who I was. And I thought that was such an impactful time in my life. How can I continue to impact the lives of, of people that are, that are in college? Well, I got involved in coaching some youth soccer at that point, and I took my first coaching course. I had just finished my, I was in my master's degree. I was just finishing up my master's degree. 
Um, and I, I was take, I took a United Soccer Coaches, NSCAA at the time, National Soccer Coaches Association, took my first coaching course, and I threw my name in for a hat for a college job in Missouri. And, and the fact of the matter is, I, I mean, I, I got the job. I'm, I'm 23 years old, and I got the head coaching job at Missouri Valley College, and it had nothing to do with what I knew about soccer. Actually, it had nothing to do with even with what I knew about coaching. The coach that I just left was teaching general psychology. And human relations courses. I just graduated with my master's degree in guidance and counseling. I was the only candidate that had a background in psychology. I got the job because I can come in and teach a psychology class and, and, and teach, you know, it was a small private school. So I was teaching and then I, I got to be coaching. And that's when I really realized that this is what I want to do for, for, for my living. I, I, I really took that deep dive into that. So I spent some time at Missouri Valley College. I had a little break as a high school counselor, and then I was very fortunate, blessed, um, God winks, I call them, uh, given the opportunity to start the, intercollegi the uh, intercollegiate soccer program at the University of Minnesota Morris for women's soccer. So again, here I am a young, you know, I think I was 26 at the time. I'm starting a college soccer program. And, you know, when, you, when you're doing that, I, there wasn't a blueprint for how to start programs, right? This was the time when programs were starting to pop up everywhere on the women's side. It, it was really that Title IX happened. And in that, eight, that, that late 90s is really when, boom, women's soccer exploded in, in the intercollegiate market. It, you know, it was really because of Title IX. And so there wasn't this blueprint on how you start a program. So I had to rely on what I thought was important. And it always came back to how do I build relationships? How do I, how do I, I always approach things from the positive standpoint of things. I never coached from what we do wrong. I always coached from what we do right. And I knew that, that that's what I knew. And that's how I went about coaching. And when you're starting and you're under resource, you don't have everything. You, 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 you don't have all the tools. Um, you might not have all the experience. What you got to rely on is what you do know and focus on the good of what is in people and the good of what's in yourself. Cause we're going to, we talk about that in coaching the bigger game, the good of what's in me and how do I bring that out in terms of coaching to build relationships that help people. And so I coached that women's program for eight years, ended up winning three conference championships. And then the school wanted to add men's soccer. And so they asked me if I would start the men's program. Well, now I had a blueprint. I knew what it was going to take to build a, to start a program. So I have had, now I'm starting my second intercollegiate soccer program in my career. Um, but now I had a blueprint and I, I kind of go back to relationships. I don't know if I knew building relationships was the, was the way I termed it at the time. Men's program, I knew that it was relationships that was going to help me. So it was tying into relationships with coaches, uh, club coaches, uh, you know, tying into relationships with high school coaches, as well as really intentionally building relationships with kids as I recruited. So I actually home visited almost every single kid I recruited, which was really that that's not typical at a, at an NCAA division three level, NAI level that doesn't normally happen. And so that was important for me is building these connections with the players and the parents through home visits. And, you know, what I found through doing that is we ended up not finding the best players. We found the right players. Mm. And, and that was, that was so important to that. Um, fast forward, I end up at Spring Hill college for a few years and I rebuilt the women's program there. And, um, uh, and then I had to take a break. I, I mean, I, I, at that point now, I'm almost 20 years in and it was time for me to take a break. And my wife had just taken a job that allowed that allowed me to take a break. And it, she was focused on what she was doing. So I started building what, what I call the leadership development program. Um, I wanted to really focus on what were the things that made me successful as a coach? What about how did I build these relationships? Um, what are the lessons that I taught all my players and how could I instill that to other people? Uh, and so I, I started a company called Volta Sports and Sports and Leadership at the time. And from that, I, I really started to take a, a deep dive in myself. I actually started to go get some coaching for myself and work on my own self-leadership and what was important for me to move on because 
where I was stuck as a coach and what I was doing, I was stuck at how do I continue to get better? And I was trying to get better by, by trying to win more games or, or do more of this. And where I really got getting better is I had to redefine what my why was. Why was I doing what I did and what was important for me? And I had a mentor that kind of told me, says, well, what do you do? And, 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 and I, I, Ed DeCosta, I mean, Ed DeCosta was this incredible mentor of mine. And he goes, what do you do, Christian? What is it that you do? I go, well, Ed, I, I, coach, college, I coach soccer, but I want to I wanna do leadership training. He says, no, you, you don't coach soccer. What do you do? And I go, I, I, I coach college soccer. And he goes, no, what, what do you do? And it was there that I really had to sit back and go, what is it that I am really doing? And what it was is I'm impacting the lives of young men and women at a time in their life cycle that they're trying to define who they are and what they want to become. And that when I had that experience, how can I make that experience grand for them? How do I make that experience important for them that they walk out of that college truly understand? So it wasn't about that I was a soccer coach. It wasn't that I was a college soccer coach. It was I was a person that was impacting the lives of college students through the game of soccer. And when I realized that aspect of that was my why, then I was actually even able to focus more on how do I impact more people and do it even on a grander scale. And so that, that's kind of where that started. So, you know, um, I, before we transition into the AOS and eventually the coaching the bitter game, I, I, I probably would let you talk a little bit about you know, what you heard in all that, because I, I did talk a lot about, you know, how I got to the point of AOS. Yeah, absolutely. And AOS is athletes of significance, and we will get into that a little bit more. Um, and so, yeah, what I would say is that it, there's so much there, as you talked about, there's so many different spots. I mean, one of the things you, you didn't mention, and it doesn't surprise me that you didn't mention it, is you were just uh, inducted into the Minnesota Morris Hall of Fame um, for your, you know, starting up those programs and the conference titles and all that different stuff. But I, I venture to guess that none of that would have happened if you were focused on just winning games but you're focused on developing people and developing programs. And, and that's, that's something that um, is why I, I love working with you on this stuff. But, but uh, I just want to hear, you know, with that, with all the work that you're doing, you know, in these different programs you're doing now, like, what do you wish as you go back to those early years? Like, what do you wish? What are some of the things like, you know, now after coaching, you would be entering your 26th year. Um, what is that? golden anniversary what's what's 25 yeah silver golden whatever um some some sort of precious metal um and what what do, what do you wish like going back what what do you wish you knew i um, mean you know, it's kind of like a classic question like you know versus you know some of the things you wish you, you don't wish you knew because you had to learn them but some of those things like what are those things you wish you knew um back then that you don't know now i mean that you know now um I'm going to tweak this question just a little bit for you and then, and, and then come back to answering the question. What I wish I would have done earlier in my career, I think is important to answering this question that yeah. you have. As I started at, at, um, at Missouri Valley College, that first job back in the 90s, um, I, did, I did befriend uh, you know, a coach at a, at a rival school. And it wasn't a rival school. They weren't a conference component, but it was another school in Missouri and, and Rick Burns, and I got to talk with Rick Burns, and Rick Burns was quite a bit older than me. He was later in his career, and we would just, we get into talking, and you know, he actually loved the fact that I was doing these home visits, and he said, you know, what you're doing from a recruiting standpoint is different than what a lot of people are doing, but I really wish I would have spent more time talking with him and letting him mentor me, right? I, I, I really wish I would have, you know, here, I want a mentor, you know, help me, help me understand where you've been and where I'm at and how do we navigate these different things and what have you learned through these situations? So I really wish that I would have engaged in Rick as a mentor a lot earlier than I did because my, the, the next time I really invented, engaged in with a mentor wasn't until, you know, I was in my late forties. 
Mm. You know, so there was a 20 year span that a lot of that work was doing. I was doing on, I was doing it myself. I was learning, but how much more could I have learned? Yeah. And so idea of wherever you're at, if you're starting at, at, at stage one or you're already at stage 10, do you have a mentor that's there to work with you? Um, I think in terms of what do I wish I knew then that I know now is um, and that, that's really a good question because there's so many things that, you know, I wish I knew how to connect with people better, right? And, and, that, and that comes from the, you know, you and I have talked about this, the DISC assessment. I'm sure you've talked about DISC assessment. The, the idea of what I learned about DISC assessment and how people are operating and, and asking two really basic questions, right? You know, you know, what type of person are you in terms of your motor and your speed and how you operate? And then are you task or people oriented? And asking those two simple questions can really help me understand how somebody communicates. I know now who I am as a quote C personality has held me back from so many incredible opportunities because I don't put myself out there. I am so reserved and cautious and thinking and cognitive that I've probably missed out on opportunities to engage with other people. That now that I know about those things, I, I am able to put myself out there to be a, a constant learner and learning from people. And you know, Phil, you and I are the opposites. And I yep. think that's why we work well together is because mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, I, I sometimes need that eye to get me excited, right? Because I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And so if I really would have known that, if I would have known DISC, honestly, 20 years ago, how much better would I have connected with my players and with my colleagues and developed developing my programs? And, and not, I, I don't, I don't, I love everything that's happened in my career yeah. and I've been very successful in my career, but that one question, what, what do I wish I knew then? I wish I would have known about this idea of disc assessment, yeah. you know, and, and how do people operate and think and, and process and communicate because it's changed my entire world in the last seven to eight years. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's why we talk about that so much on the show. I mean, it's something that you and I both, like, I wish I knew that well earlier in my life. I wish I knew that when I got married. I wish I knew that when I started having kids. I wish I knew DISC, you know, when I first coached, when I first worked with people, when I was a teenager and I wasn't necessarily comfortable in my own skin, like all these different things that it helps us understand. And that's something that I, I get really excited. That's why, I mean, that's why you and I are doing what we're doing. It's why I teach DISC. That's why I train DISC. That's why I've been able to do that with the, you know, different university teams, different high school teams, different organizations. It's because when people understand themselves and they understand others, man, things can start clicking, things can start happening that never would have if we're just winging it. And uh, that's usually what we do. And so, yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because that's a similar answer that Sir Alex Ferguson said. I'm not saying you're Sir Alex Ferguson, <laughs> definitely, but that's a similar answer he had to the question of what would you wish you knew at the beginning of your career? And he said, uh, I wish I knew how to communicate better. And that's what DISC is all about. It's about how do we communicate better? How do we connect with people? How do we understand people? How do we understand people so that we can connect with them better and communicate with them better and resolve conflict better and do all these things better? And so that's something that I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, a great, great answer. And it's always a hard question too to answer sure. because, because if you, if you knew all those things, you wouldn't have done everything the way you did it. And if you didn't do everything the way you did it, you wouldn't have learned other lessons that you, we can only learn some lessons by just failing miserably and learning it through the school of hard knocks and learning it through that and failing forward. And so yet, I think there's things that you and I both know uh, we're better off not failing in some of these ways, right? Not burning bridges, not creating toxic cultures, not unintentionally having kids burn out that didn't need to burn out, but it was just, we actually burn them out because of how we're wired and how we don't really understand that. So that's okay. something that I think we need to, you know, realize that there are some things that we need to let people fall off their bike, so to speak, when we're mentoring them. But 
we don't let them fall off a cliff, right? And these are some of these things that I think we can we can help people to ride their bikes better, so to speak. But anyway, you you want to say something? Well, I I think as as we as we talk about that, I'm going, you know, the 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 difficult the difficult relationships I had with players throughout my career, because I am not, it hasn't all been roses, right? It mm-hmm. hasn't been a better roses. There, there's been some difficult relationships that I've had with players. And I, I wonder what would have been different with those particular players, because I did connect with, with, with players. I think our, my success happened from connecting with players, mm-hmm. but the ones that I had those difficult relationships, what would have been different and right. not in terms of my win and losing. That, it's, it's irrelevant to me winning or losing. It's what would have been different with their life. Could I have had a different impact on their life because the relationship might have been different? And, yeah. and you know, you, you can't answer. So I think about even like the relationships I'm having now and with the players I work with now and my current players. I know who they are. I understand their assessments. I, I talk to them. And even, uh, even, you know, even the ones that have been stressed relationships, I walk away feeling good about the conversations I've had with those players in that, you know, I might not just be the right coach for them, but I didn't leave them hurting. Yeah. And, and I think that was important. Absolutely. No. And that's, that's just it. Right. Like, I mean, it's not always going to be a fit. It's not always the right fit for the, and that's something that we talk about a lot on the, on the show too. What's the right fit, right? It's not always the right fit for you to coach a particular player and that's fine. And that's yep. not, not a bad thing. It's just reality. But don't make it because we don't put in the work on our end, right? Like, have we done our work? If they're unhealthy, if they're toxic, we can hopefully help them get healthy. But, you know, that's, that's something that we can't force anyone to do anything. So with that, I, I do want to go in. You teased this at the beginning. This wasn't even on the, the kind of pseudo script. We don't have a script at all. But this wasn't even anywhere near the questions. But we talk a lot about you know, youth sports and hopefully we can start. And as I kind of talk about, and I know Diego Bocanegra and I talked about it, kind of the redeeming youth sports. And I say that because I do believe when we were younger, um, it was better, right? I think um, in the sense of uh, parents were coaching a lot more. I don't think we got as serious as we, uh, you know, are as quickly as we are nowadays and you know and the the idea of year round and specialization all those things but can you speak to that from your perspective like what if there were you know things that you if if you have a magic wand and you could say i'm going to change these things today and i think these two or three things will have the most impact in helping our youth to be able to truly flourish um in every area of life um through youth sports yeah what what would you do well, I, I can speak to it from the standpoint. This is why I'm concerned about it. This is what yeah. we, I, I think we need to understand why I'm concerned about what we're talking about on youth sports. And and, I, and I'm talking about that age group, even starting as young as U8 now through that U15 age. And then there's that next group is that U15 to U19, which is the kids that I'm recruiting, right? Those are the kids that we want to see. Do they want to come on to college? So I, I'm really, the things that are bothering me and the things that are addressed, I, I'm off often asking myself this question I've, I've asked myself this question i've talked about this with a number of different people in light of the recent suicides that we've seen with college athletes we, we've seen this you know a, a number of, of of athletes that have taken their lives at the college level and so as a college coach that really concerns me what is going on and where are we missing the boat that we're having these players under so much pressure that they can't handle it anymore, that they, they, they feel the only way out is to take their lives. And so now that you're, I'm really, really cognitive of that idea and what am I doing with my own teams and what am I doing with training people? And it got me thinking, what is happening is we are now gone into, and, and I'm going to call it the alphabet league. That's what I call it. That, I, I mean, that's the way I term it. Whether it's MLS next, GA, DA, um, ECNL, ECNLR, um, E64, all these quote, elite platforms and i'm seeing all these parents saying i have to have my kid in this elite platform we have to be doing this because it's the only way for them to get to college and they're not going to be able to play college soccer if they're not playing at the highest level and i and i'm i'm going so we're now putting kids i'm hearing 10 year olds are playing ecnl and parents are spending ten thousand dollars ten thousand dollars a season taking their kid across the country to play in ecnl that's at 10. They're not going to be a college kid until when? 
19, 18, 19. Right, right. That, that's eight years. Yep. That's $80,000. What if you just actually put your kid in a healthy environment locally with good coaching, where good development's taking place? And that $80,000 you put in the bank, you don't need the college scholarship. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to find a good place to go play. I think that we have put so much pressure on our kids at such an early age now on these elite platforms that by the time the kid hits high school, they, 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 and they don't have mom and dad there. And I'm not saying mom and dad are the ones putting the pressure on them, but they, they, they have time to focus on themselves. And it's like, all I've been doing for the last eight years is go, 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 go. And, you know, and then this desire, I have to win. I have to play at the highest level. And then all of a sudden I can't do it anymore. Where I think we need to go back to be able within your region, have plenty of competition and player development. And if we have all these coaches with all these licensures, let's just focus on developing players Let's, you know, we should be playing a game a week. Why are we going to these tournaments and playing five games in, in two days? And, and now we're dealing, we, we see injuries that are coming up. We're seeing, you know, all the burnout that is happening. And so what I would love to see change within the youth soccer world is can we go back to just staying regional, community-based playing? Think, I mean, I, and I've never been to the UK. I, I honestly, I haven't been to the UK, but what I do know about it you play within your community and in our little community and our little neighborhood is going to go play your neighborhood. And we're going to play this name. And, and it, the, the, the desire and the play happens through that. And we build that up and, and stop putting pressure on the league that you're playing in is going to get you to college. Yeah. I'm really, really passionate about this. We can talk about AOS and, and the complete player pathway that I talk about. There is when we start using the leagues, the alphabet leagues, as part of our recruiting tool as parents, what we're doing is we're going straight to identification. We're saying the only way my kid could get recruited is if they're in this league, right? And what you've missed out on is you've missed out on the entire pathway where all the fun is and where all the enjoyment is and where all the learning takes place. And that is, how are you planning for college? How are you going through a process of knowing what it takes to be recruited for college? And, and understand that process and understand what coaches do. And then how do you develop yourself mentally? How do you develop yourself physically? How do you develop yourself spiritually? How do you develop yourself in terms of what I call leadership? And then finally, character skills. Once you've done complete, a planning process and, you've, and you've, you understand the process to get recruited and you've developed and, and you've worked on these other aspects, then identification can happen and it doesn't have to be at the league. Yep. It, could, it could be, it could be playing high school. I've okay. recruited an all American out of a high school game. Yep. Yep. I mean, I, I, I Absolutely. just, I, I just don't understand why we think that we have to have all these elite platforms and whatever, every new elite platform that comes out, we're diluting the previous elite platforms are already there. Yeah. So what we're actually doing is diluting the development process of the players. And from a, from a college coach, it makes it more and more difficult for college coaches to actually be able to recruit well and identify talent because a lot of the best teams aren't even playing against each other nope. because there's too many different platforms, too many different tournaments. The, the ECNL tournament's going on the same weekend as Surf Cup, the same weekend as the ODP tournament, the same weekend as the national, you know, for USYS. And it's, it's just it's ridiculous. So you can't, I mean, and their budgets, they have to say, okay, well, I'm going to have to just go to one tournament. So they pick the ECNL or whatever. And some of those ECNL games are 12, nothing. And some of the other, you know, it's just, it's, it's just like you said, there's, there's so much too. And that's why I was saying, you know, so much of it is you talk about go regional. Like that's what we used to do. I played in South Orange County, California. And I remember we had some of the best tournaments in the country, like, like it is now but we didn't have people from all over the country. We right. had, I mean, maybe a Phoenix team. Like we were like, wow, their team came from Phoenix. That's crazy. How fun. Um, you know, I think when I got older, it was like 16, 17, maybe you see a Utah team or something, but you never saw like a New Jersey team or a something else because it just wasn't even, it wasn't even part of the deal, you know? And, you know, some people are going to write in and be like, Hey, I was, I was in New Jersey and I played there in 1988. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. There might've been one offs, but 
point is, it wasn't the norm, which it is now. It wasn't the expectation, which it is now. And you talked about that like eight years. I mean, take the money aside. If all you're doing for eight years is telling these kids, this is what you have to do to get to the next level. You haven't even asked them the, what, what's the most important question there. Not most important. One of the most important questions. Do they even want to play at the next level? How do they know at 10? <laughs> they don't, they can't possibly know at 10. But, but I mean, I, I don't want to just speak for you. You're a college coach. I'm not a college coach, you know? So from a recruiting perspective, am I right on that? As far as how oh, yeah. hard is it to recruit now? Like what yeah. the heck? Well, I, I mean, I, I, so again, when we could talk genders, yeah, I coach both teams now and I've coached both teams throughout my career. I've coached on the women's side, I've coached on the men's side and now at Paradise Valley, I'm actually coaching both teams. So I recruit both teams now. And even I, I can see even on, you know, there's a difference in the genders, mm-hmm. right? Um, the guys with the guys, I, I can go out and I, I, I host a tryout and I can have 50 guys show up for my tryout, right? And, and I've got guys that are contacting me all the time. On the girls, I think because of the success that we've had on women's soccer in the U.S. and that women's soccer, we were the first country to truly mm-hmm. embrace developing the women's game, the, the, yeah. the female game. So, and then NCAA really embraced that when I talked about, again, back in the 90s when the Title IX happened and, and, the, and the, the blow up of soccer, women's soccer became the equalizer for gender equity against other sports. And so there was, and there still is, there's still more women's soccer programs in this country at the college level than there is men's soccer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that, that, that's just the reality. There's more opportunities. There's more scholarship money out there for women. And so when that happened, we started seeing this big influx on the girls. ECNL started with women or with the girls. There wasn't an ECL yeah. boys team for I right. don't know how many years, right? Right. Yeah. Um, just came, know, that's brand new. That's like yeah. two, three years old. Yeah. Right. So ECNL, that, that was that first kind of maybe that elite platform that really mm-hmm. started to take hold was ECNL. And I think, it, you know, I think, again, if the intentions was right, they, they tried to have the regional locations, but then people started thinking, I have to go all the way from New Jersey to Phoenix, you know, that, that whatever that is, that happened. But what has happened in the women's side, again, we've put so much pressure on these young girls that they're missing out on their high school years. And I hear this all the time. This is not, this is not me guessing. This is not a speculation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am telling you specifically, as I've talked to players, high school players about wanting to go and play in college soccer, I would venture to say one and three have decided not to play out after, after college oh, yeah. or after high school. Oh yeah. But they're done yep. because they've missed out on their high school experience. And what they tell me is I just want to go and be a college student and have fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm talking, these are top level players oh, yeah. that could play at oh, Division yeah. One yep. big programs. And so, yep. so now we, we're actually seeing easily, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I think it's about one in three, maybe one in four, 25 to 30% of our female women players at high school are choosing not to play. Yep. Yep. So you've already decreased the, the amount of playing. Secondly, now we have more women's programs than any other program out there. And so now there's more opportunities for women to play. So it becomes even harder in terms of the recruiting and how you go about recruiting that now it becomes, we, we get into this fight and this is where, what happened is through this entire fight, we start recruiting the kids earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. Yep. Because we're having eight year old, eighth graders commit to college. Mm-hmm. What is mm-hmm. an eight? That, that was completely asinine. And so at least the NCAA came in and, and stopped that communication aspect of things. Right. <clears throat> you know, and, and tried to scale back that when you can start to talk to the athletes is a more reasonable time in their junior and senior year. Yeah. Because we, we created this monster of we, we got to I got to commit by my freshman year. Otherwise, I'm not going to find a place to play. That's right. Yep. Yep. It's, <coughs> it's, yeah. It's, it drives me nuts. Let's it's crazy. And I, I will say, like, you just threw out an anecdote. I'm going to throw out another anecdote. I mean, you threw out, like, a stat that is, is not based on any study, by the way, but it's based oh, on experience. Right. But that one in three, I had three girls on our, our my uh, high school team this year. All three made first team, all league, Sierra Foothill League, best league in, in Northern California. Um, and three of them made first team, all league. One of them is playing in college. Three of them, all three of them were ECNL players. Um, all three of them could have played D1 and one of them chose to go. And she just 
she signed in the last two months with one school and then she actually got another offer for for money um recently and so the, these this is the reality that these these girls um and boys but but i think girls even more so are are like you said they're missing out on their on their college or high school years it's like they've been playing college soccer since they were 12 because they've been traveling without their parents they've been traveling all over the country They've been playing in these showcases with people from all over the country. It's we're putting them in these situations. They're absolutely not ready for. And through that, they're missing all these lessons that we've been talking about. One thing I want to say before, and I do want to get into those lessons because that's what AOS coaching, the bigger game, the complete player pathway, all that is all about is teaching those lessons and make sure we don't miss those lessons. But one of the things I, I just read this quote today, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. I know. I, I agree with it, but I, I think this, this is another issue we have with youth sports is because there are so many clubs and so many teams, we lack a lot of, you know, really good coaches at those younger levels. And quite frankly, at the older levels too, we have a lot of coaches, but not necessarily a lot of them are great coaches when you consider life skills, when you consider character, when you consider even the soccer side. But Arsene Wenger had a quote and he said, it's better for an eight to 12 year old child to have no coach than to have a bad coach. And uh, what do you think of that? I, I absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely. I, I mean, listen, we can talk about the game being the greatest teacher, right? You know, whether it was soccer or whether it was, we called it home room derby when I was a kid, or whether we call we, we had our version of, of touch football, fight football. I mean, we created our own games yep. based on the environment that we had and the circumstances we had. And we went out and we made the rules and we created the games. And that's where we learned. That's where the fun of competing comes in and those types of things. And so, yeah, I, rather than having a coach tell me, and then the coach that's doing it wrong, and the coach that's yelling all the time or the coach that is not giving you know, the right things. I mean, I just read, I just literally read a, a, a post again. And th this post was from a couple of years ago is right after Iceland made their big run. Right. You remember Iceland? Mm -hmm. and, and I do. Yeah. Okay. So th this was a post that came back up, but, but talking about Iceland and that run that they made and how the, you know, it, 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 they actually got the world behind them. Let's talk, mm -hmm. let's be serious. The entire world was Absolutely. behind Iceland with, with that. But how did that happen? It happened because Iceland made a decision that their best coaches were going to coach the youngest players, mm. right? They, 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 you had to have that. You had to be, have a certain licensure to be working with the younger players. Secondly, they have a, I, I can't, I, I'm not, I don't want to be quoted wrong, but it's this crazy coach to player number that that is you know ridiculous where the players are getting that interaction with the coach mm -hmm. at a regular basis and they they invested in the facilities and all those types of things so I, I think part of it is we think our best coaches need to be with our best players and our highest level players why don't we think about flipping that a little bit and let's let's have some of our high licensed coaches with our younger players mentoring volunteer coaches mentoring yeah. young coaches why are we, we, we have this crazy model that's set up that you got to go through all this licensure system, but you're not really being mentored. You're trying to learn along the way. Why don't we put better coaches with the younger coaches at the younger level and do some mentorship and, and teach and, and develop coaches that way? I think the other piece of back to my whole experience of what I do, how, I, how I've grown up. We are thought that coaching is about coaching X's and O's. Okay. Anybody that studied John Wooden has got to know that the X and O's was the last thing that John Wooden worked mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. It was the pyramid of success. Right. And how he, how you show up and how you, how you show up every day. And that, you know, you can't, you, you can't miss a practice and come back and give me 110% because there's no such thing as 110%. Yep. There's only a hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So you need to give me a hundred percent every day. Mm -hmm. And so I, I focus on what is our, what is really a coach? I mean, how do we really define a coach? What is the job as a coach? And so if I'm doing speaking and I've spoken at, you know, at, at the, for state or associations, you know, I've, I've been at the United Soccer Coaches Convention running panels. And when we start talking about what it is, that's going on and we want to answer these types of questions what i often find out i'll ask 
Why do you coach? And you'd be surprised. The coaches, I, I want to teach life skills. I want to be able to, you know, to help them become a better version of themselves. You know, they say all they say all the right things. Mm -hmm. But then when I ask them, how are you doing it? Mm -hmm. They don't have an answer. Yep. What they are doing is they're going and trying to figure out how to win by coaching X's and O's. Yeah. So they go and they, they don't know how and to build life skills. Yeah. Are what I call character skills mm -hmm. or what I call leadership skills and understand I, I'm very intentional. I want your I want the audience to hear this, Phil. All of these things are character skills, leadership yeah. skills. Okay. They are not traits. Yeah. They are skills because they can be learned, they can be taught, they can be improved upon, they can be developed. And so as coaches, we have to do a better job. If, if we're going to say that's why we want to coach, then we have to have that implemented into what we do, mm -hmm. right? It's not just about the X's and O's. And we need to stop coaching for the wins yeah. on the field and for the scoreboard and for the feel good. We need to start coaching for making players enjoy the game and, and, and feel good about you know, how they played when they walked off that field, win, loss, or tie. Yeah, and absolutely. so it's really I think that we need to that's part of what we talk about coaching a good coach understands us a good coach is not playing for their record a good coach isn't playing for their ego a good coach isn't playing for wins and goals a good coach is playing to make sure that every single one of those players can become the best version of themselves when they're done at the end of the season that's right that's right all right um I'm going to actually change over here real quick and because my internet is unstable. So just a sec, I'm going to switch over to a new one. You there? You back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back. All right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's something that, you know, it's interesting because how, the last two episodes, I didn't, I didn't intentionally do this, but last week, uh, George Blamo of, of uh, he's, he's the amazing life coach over in Liberia and to hear his story and how he went through a lot of these things. And I, I just imagine he didn't have, you know, these UEFA a licensed coaches that he was uh, getting coached by early on in Liberia, you know, but and he was actually told by people early on, like, you're never going to make it. You're not going to like, you don't have a chance. You're too weak you to, you know, whatever. And he ended up making the national team and he ended up, you know, getting a double masters after people told. And he, then what did he do? He went back to coaching and he decided that, you know, coaching isn't about X's and O's. This is a guy who played on the national team. This is a guy who had to work his tail off and he realized that he can actually teach them about life. So he created the whole life coaching book that we had last week. Go listen to that episode from last week. Amazing, amazing man doing amazing things. He ends up being an ambassador to the UN. Just incredible, incredible story. You heard it last week. If you didn't hear it, go back, listen to that and check out that whole life coaching book. But the reason I bring that up is because you similarly have coached for a really long time and you realize like, as you just said, it's not about the X's and O's. We know John Wooden said, it's not about the X's and O's, right? Great coaches look at it and go, it's about so much more. And you know that too, which is, you know, why you started AOS and you develop that athlete of significance program and you, you develop complete payer pathway. It's why we are doing coaching the bigger game, but can you just kind of start with AOS and give the progression of why you're doing what you're doing beyond coaching? Cause you could just, you know, continue coaching right off to the sunset as many coaches do. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you're saying, there's more. And I want to just hear that story. Like just, you know, what, what is that more? And why do you think it's so important to be doing what you're doing and what we're doing together with coaching the bigger game? Sure. So I, I think it stems from Phil, as I, as I was in that transition of leaving, you know, Spring Hill college and kind of, I was working on, you know, what am I going to do next? I, I, I didn't, I walked away from the college game, but I don't know if I, I was walking away completely. I knew I might want to get back into it, but what was I going to do during that time? And I started to focus on, on myself and 
listen, I, I've gone through my A, B, and C license. I've gone through United Soccer Coaches Premier and National License. I've done the goalkeeping licenses. I've, I've even done a Brazilian license. And, you know, all that X's and O's stuff is fantastic. I even sat on a UEFA license, you know, back in December, um, the C license. I, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't get it. I just sat in and it was helping one of my, one of my other good friends as he, he was working on that. So that was to just continue to gain knowledge and everything. But one of the things that always frustrated me because I had to go back to Coach V Hill that really poured into us the why we're, we're doing that when you're at these coaching clinics, we spend like 10 minutes and, and I'm exaggerating, mm-hmm. but you, you might spend a lecture on sports psychology. Yeah. The entire coaching license. But if I go and I talk to high level athletes They'll, they'll sit there and say, you know, it's at, when you get to the highest level, the talent is all the same. It really, the, the, at the highest level, the talent is the same. What separates you? Yeah. And it's your character. It's your leadership. It's your mental attitude. It's the, your mental skills is what mm-hmm. separates the players at the highest level. So if that is, if that's true, then why aren't we doing more of that in our coaching education programs? Yeah. So I, that, that's what, that, that there's something that always stuck with me. And so as I walked away, one of the things I wrote down is I really don't believe that coaching is a, is a four pillar process. I, 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 I don't, I, I, you know, we've been told technical, tactical, physical, psychological, and then we don't spend enough time even on the psychological as much as we do technical, tactical, and physical, at least, you know, not my experiences. We, we focus on all these, and then we're just now starting to see the psychological pillar Mm-hmm. being developed and we being more caught aware of that right yeah we can talk about the different things that are out there but honestly i i believe it's more than that and and this stems from working with college athletes and working with high school athletes i actually call it eight prongs i think there's really eight prongs that our athletes are going through and we have to understand these eight prongs and and i think where i i it, it turned in we you and i have changed it a little bit but I initially turned it at when we focus on just four pillars, when we focus on physical, technical, tactical, and, and then psychological there, we're really focusing on you know, what I call uh, being athletic centered. How athletic are you? How technical are you? How, you know, that, that we're, we're focusing on the athleticism of being an athlete. Yeah. And I really believe as coaching, and this comes back from my studies of John Wooden, my studies uh, uh, with, with Joe V. Hill, my, my studies of Carol, Tony Dungy, Right. I, I, you know, co- coaches from other areas, we need to be more athlete centered. And what do I mean by athlete centered? There's more that's influencing an athlete than just the technical, tactical and the physical. We have to understand their academics. How are they learning? Not, not only what are they doing in school and what they're learning, but how do they learn? What is their process to learning? Do we understand how they learn? We need to have a we need to have what I call I call a spiritual prong. I call it a spiritual prong because I'm faith based. And my, my spiritual prong is based on my faith. I know I'm going to come across non-faith-based players and coaches, so I call it the moral prong. It, it could be your moral compass, mm-hmm. right? My moral compass is based in my faith. But what is it that's helping you make the decisions that you're making in life? Why are you going to do that? What are you looking to that's helping you make those decisions that you are going to be faced with? Because you are going to be made faith. I don't like this person. How am I going to respond to that person? I don't like what happened to me here. How am I going to deal with that? Why are we, do we not talk about that? So we need to have that, that spiritual prong needs to be really, you know, in, in depth and understanding there. Um, I kind of, I, I kind of put psycho and social together. I think the sociological aspects, you know, what are we doing from a sociological aspect? Do we understand the environment in which our kids are coming from? If we don't understand the sociological impacts of our players, we're missing the boat as coaches. We have to understand what is influencing them at home. I am now in a very large Hispanic population. I have a large group of first-generation Hispanic students that come and play for me. And I, you know, I'm, I come from a Hispanic family. And I understand that you know, a lot of these young men that I coach, the next step for them after high school is going and working with dad mm-hmm. or working for the business. But what can we do to change that, that, that narrative that they get an education that can actually change the narrative for the family because they do get the education? I, I had to get parents to come into the home visits and I have to have mom and dad 
in agreement with why the kid wants to come and play for us. Yeah. Because if I have mom and dad in agreement with us, then we start to break down the social barriers that might be in play for me to get the most out of my player. If I don't do that, the first time dad calls and says, I need you here at the work site, what's the kid doing? He's leaving yeah. practice and he's leaving his team hanging. That's right. That's right. So because of this, so, so we, we have to be aware of that sociological aspect of what's happening. And I think that that, you know, if you if you want to picture that, folks, like we're not just making this stuff up, actually, it's obviously dramatized. But that movie McFarland, I think, did a really good job with that. Right. Yep. To show that yep. picture of, hey, my, my dad needs me. We got to yep. we got to work. And then for the coach to understand that, to be able to come into that and say, OK, how can we have a win win here? Right. How can we because these kids need running. And because that was a cross country movie and you need them on the farm. So how can we make it a both and rather than an either or? What does that look like? But you need to understand that before you could actually come into that. Uh, and, and then leadership skills. I, I'm just so I'm so passionate about what we call leadership and character skills. You know, um, so th that that was this idea of how do we be, create an athlete centered? You know, we we focus on the being an athlete centered coach. That that's mm -hmm. so I had this idea of this eight prongs back in here, and then I wanted to mold it and develop it and and work on that. And at the same time, it was okay. Where have I had great impact? Really, at the time, is with really with the athletes. And um, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night one night. It literally felt in the middle of the night. I woke up in a dead sweat, and I had to go find my journal, and I wrote my journal. AOS, athlete of significance. And what it was, was this idea that coaches don't recruit success. They recruit significance. And what I mean by that is coaches are looking for the players that are going to bring the greatest value to their programs. Your talent is important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying talent doesn't matter. Your talent absolutely does matter. But also, what matters with your talent is who you are, the character you're going to bring, the leader you're going to be, the type of person you're going to be when you show up on my campus. Just being a good player is not enough anymore. Right. You have what is the full value you're going to bring to my program. And I determine that as being significant. And so we wrote an entire curriculum based off of this idea of significance that we have 12 skills of significance, starting with being a servant leader. The very first one is S is a servant leader. How are you going to serve those around you? Because only when I give up myself and I, if I can teach my players to give up who they are and give up themselves to their teammates, will they get in return tenfold? Mm -hmm. So if I really want to go to the next level, I'm, I got to learn to give of myself so that I open myself up to receive more. So you know, it's so important. So we talk about servant leadership. We talk about having integrity. We have to talk about, you know, having an attitude of gratitude. We had to talk about what it means to be a nurturing player. How do we nurture those around us? You know, at the college level, you're going to be a senior. How are you going to bring along the freshmen as they come in? What is normally what we do? Mm -hmm. We haze the freshmen and say, you got to take care of all That's the right. equipment. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> right? We make them, we make them serve. We make right? them be the grunts. But, yep. But you talk about the all blacks. What do the all blacks say? Sweep the shed. Like leaders the captain sweep the shed. shed that's right they're the right? servant leaders so yep. so we we need to talk about how do how do we have this nurturing attitude to bring our players in but you want right. to know what another one is how do, are, do have we taught our kids truly how to be competitive mm. i think we teach them how to win right but is that being competitive i mm -hmm. i i i think that's a skill that needs to be taught and then we talk absolutely about how, how do we learn to be competitive? So AOS stemmed from there and that they, we created a, a recruiting education platform to talk about AOS and develop that and start talking with clubs and organizations. And that we come into a club and we work with you and we give you that experience. And then from AOS, again, the kind of complete player pathway came out that that's part of that complete player pathway. Mm -hmm. But the, the funny story is you and I initially got on a discussion, the talk about you wanted to bring me on a year and a half ago or a year ago early in your in your podcast you mm -hmm. wanted to bring me on and and talk a little bit about aos and through a common connection with disc and you and i started talking and you you said something about coaches and i go well i really have my burning passion back over here i have this real big thing and that's coaching the bigger game right now it wasn't termed that at the time 
right. it was turned to how do we become an athlete centered coach, mm-hmm. right? How, how do we do that? What does it mean to be an athlete centered coach? And what do I need to do as a coach myself that to develop athletes that, you know, and focus on this, on my athletes as, as individuals. And as you and I talk more and more and more, we, we, we've decided to collaborate and we've come up with this, this program called coaching the bigger game, elevating significance in sports. We are elevating the value that sports has in our lives. What are the leadership things that we are learning? What are the, what are the lessons that we learn? How do we grow through this experience and sport in our lives and elevate what we do and what we give back to others? <laughs> and really the focus on, you know, Phil is it's not about coaching the bigger game is not about X's and O's. We're not going to get together with you and talk about what formations you should be playing. We're not going to talk about the differences between three, four, three and three, five, two and four, three, three or whatever. We're, we're going to talk about how do you deal with a difficult player? How do you deal with um, parents that are questioning things? We're going to talk about how do you actually, I know where we really start. How did I develop myself to become a better person? That's right. We start in self-leadership. Yep. Right. If, if you want your players to become better players, then you better start focusing on yourself to become a better coach. Mm-hmm. Because if all you know is X's and O's, all your players are ever going to learn from you is X's and O's. That's right. That's right. So we start with learning what, defining what your why is. So, you know, know, we we can talk a little bit about the big game is, is it's really, it's a process of elevate self. The coaching, the bigger game is how do I elevate myself as a coach first and foremost? I spent a year and a half taking a deep, deep dive in my own personal development and leadership through mentors and, and being part, you know, John Maxwell and, uh, you know, Scott Fay and uh, Ed DaCosta, these are three men that really poured into my life beyond not just being a, a, a soccer coach, but how, who I am and how I develop what I want. Then from yeah. there, we start to focus on, we need to, we need to elevate the player first. Mm-hmm. How, do, how do we elevate the individual? So we, we've elevated ourselves. Now we got to look at elevating the player and how do we, how do we understand the player and who they are and get them to reach their full potential only from elevating the player. Then we can start to work on the team. Yeah. But where do most coaches go right away? They start with the team. How do we start make a healthy culture? Yep. I, I, you know, and there's so nothing they, wrong with that, by the way. <laughs> no, we're not saying, but there there's, we're saying yeah. there's a better way. Start, mm-hmm. So we elevate self, elevate the individual. Yeah. Now we elevate the team. And when yeah. we're elevating the team, now we are starting to see new things happen and the dynamics that happen and what happens with your team. It's just like, it's, it's so exciting. Yeah. And, you know, it gives you the goose pimples. And, you know, it's like, this is why I do what I do type thing. It's yep. what I wanted. And then what ends up doing is you're leaving your legacy. And see, and the legacy that I want to leave is not that, I was a hall of fame coach because we won all those championships. The legacy I want to leave is every single one of my players is a better person because they played for me. And when I stepped away from coaching, that's when the real eye opener was for me. That's when I woke up to the idea about this idea, this idea lit a fire in me is because not one of my players talked about the six championships we won. Not mm-hmm. one of my players talked about the All-American accolades. Not one of my players talked about, you know, everything that happened. I had players saying, coach, I still use the lessons that you taught me every day. Coach, I remember when you taught me this and it, 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 it still sticks with me today. I had parents saying, my son is a better communicator because of you. Yep. I, you know, I have a father that says, I can't believe the, the person my son has become because of being with you and working with you. Yep. That's coaching the bigger game. That's right. That's what keeps us coming back. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, and it's something that I, I look at it and go, those are the things that um, when I said nothing's wrong with teaching culture, and what I, I think there is something wrong with skipping yourself, skipping the individuals to go straight to team, because then you're missing everything. And if you're toxic as a coach, the rest of the cards are going to fall. If you have toxic individuals in your team, the rest of the cards are going to fall. You know, you're going to, you have to, you don't want to have to root out. I remember going back to the first inter- 
interview I did for this show with Paul back in episode two. And he talked about that. He goes, I'm probably slower than most coaches would recommend on getting rid of the viruses in the team. I want to be able to, you know, help them to heal. And that's what we want to teach is that, is that, how do we help them to heal? Well, you got to know yourself and how you're coming across to them before you can go into that fray. And you need to know who they are and how they're wired before you can go into that fray. So those are a lot of the things that, that we talk about and we're going to talk about on this. Now, we've talked about coaching the bigger game a lot on the show already. So we're not going to dwell on it. I did want you to, I wanted, wanted people to be able to hear your perspective on it and where it came from, from your perspective. Because I did do an off season talk on coaching the bigger game back in, you know, probably 40 episodes ago or so. You can go back and check that out if you want to learn more about the nitty gritty of it and what it looks like. Um, you can also go to coachingthebiggergame.com to find out all the details you want to know and how you can sign up and how you can get involved. You know, one of those things that we've talked about is if you're a parent listening to this and you're thinking, man, this sounds great. I wish that my coaches did it. Well, get it for them. Right. You know, that'd be a great <clears throat> gift at the end of a season or the beginning of a season, better yet. Don't wait till the end of the season, you know, because you want your kids to be able to benefit from this. This is, you know, years, decades of experience as coaches, as leaders that we're bringing to the table. It's not just us either. We're bringing in other people, you know, John Wooden, all these other people that we can't bring John Wooden in himself. But fortunately, he has memorialized his thoughts and his teaching in a lot of books and a lot of different things. And we have scoured these different leadership, amazing leadership tools to be able to put it together for the coaches. So that's something that, that I strongly encourage neither Christian nor I would be wasting any time with something that we didn't believe in ourselves and that we haven't used ourselves. And we just want to take these lessons we've learned over the years in the last couple of decades and say, how can we put this down into a program that can help younger coaches and older coaches who've never thought about this stuff? You know, these are critical things to be able to get the most out of our players and quite frankly, to flourish ourselves. So that's something that, that we want to do. And, and um, you know, I, I, I want to just kind of wrap up the episode because we are over the hour mark, which is just crazy that we're already there. But I, I do want to wrap up the episode. And, and uh, first, before we ask the last couple of questions, I ask for everybody, how can people get uh, information on athlete of significance and complete player, pa player pathway for their, for their kids or uh, if they're a coach for their teams? Yeah, so um, AOSSports.com is where AOS is at. <coughs> um, and then CompletePlayerPathway.com um, is, is where you can get information about the Complete Player Pathway and look into that. Um, you know, we're actually in the process of, of, of bringing out some new things. And so I, I you know, new launch, shall we say, as we continue to up-level what we're doing and, and as we're working with some things. And so I don't have... Uh, the complete player pathway has a, a great overview, but understand within the next you know, month or so, there's going to be a whole, whole other aspect that's going to come into play with that. Um, whether it's bringing it to a club, whether it's bringing it to a team, whether it's bringing it, you just want it for your families. It's about understanding the process. And you know what, this, this recruiting process doesn't need to be scary. Okay. Yeah. It, it doesn't need to be scary. And you, and, and please, I would say, pay attention to who you're listening to. Mm -hmm. right yep who are you listening to that's giving you the advice are you listening to one parent that went through the process and how it worked for the one parent well the only the only perspective they have is their perspective mm -hmm. and what they did and what they did worked for them but yeah. is that perspective going to work for you right whereas we are talking about over 25 years of experience of coaching college soccer and seeing the different levels and talking with college coaches and how they go about doing it. And that, you know, I think I would like to know how a college coach actually recruits so that I can make sure I'm putting myself in the right position to be recruited. That's right. That's right. Right. And, and so, and even as college coaches, we recruit differently. So it yep. takes, it takes different ways in terms of how you might approach different college coaches. That's right. And I've been through the recruiting process on the other side with my kids and with myself and my wife went through that back in the day. And now my kids have gone through that as well. And to be able to bring that perspective to it, I think it is important as well. And I remember, I not remember, it's not like it was a long time ago, it was literally a couple hours ago, but I saw another post, uh, Don Williams posted something about, hey, this June 15th date that's coming up, yeah. like it's just a date. 
<laughs> you know, people will be bragging, people will be posting, people will be saying, oh, I got contacted by this, or I got contacted by that. You know what? It's just a date and it's not the end all be all. And don't freak out and don't get too high on your horse. Right. And um, that's something I wanted to say too. When you say elevate self and elevate player, I want to make sure you guys understand we're not saying like, make a big deal about yourself or be narcissistic and make it all about yourself. No, elevate who you are as a leader, elevate your ability to lead, elevate your understanding of self, elevate to be able to help you flourish more. That's what we're talking about there. So I just want to make sure that, you know, that's not misunderstood as we just say a word can mean a lot of different things, especially right. in this English language we speak. But uh, anyway, so with that, we got, you know, we could, as we have, we could talk for hours about these things, um, but we're going to, we're going to cut it off here and go to uh, the last couple of questions, you know, so the first is, what are a couple of lessons you've learned directly from this beautiful game that we love that you have used in your marriage and your parenting? I, I, listen, I, I think that what I've learned is um, it's not what happens to you. It's how you react, mm. right? You know? Thing, stuff's going to happen to us, folks. Good stuff is going to happen to us. Bad stuff is going to happen to us. Good things are going to happen on the field. Bad things are going to happen on the field. You're going to get a call for you going one way. You're going to get a call for you that goes the opposite direction, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's a matter of how you react to it. You're going to win the game that you probably shouldn't have won. Yep. And you're going to you're going to lose the game that you should have won. Yep, absolutely. Right. And, and how do you react to it? So it, I've learned through, I've got to put things in perspective is how do I learn from what has happened to me and how do I react to what's happened to me? Um, I, you know, I, I, I do, I want just a short little story about this. And when we talk about reaction, um, I'm, I'm at Spring Hill College coaching the team there. It's the first year there, you know, we're, we're trying to build this culture and everything. And we were playing Lee University in the first, you know, one of our games. And Lee at the time, I think was at that time, three time defending national champs. And Lee comes in and beats us 12 to zero, right? We're down on that. I don't get down on it. I just focus on who we are. What can we do better? How do we improve? Fast forward, we qualify for the conference tournament for the first time in a while. Our first opponent, Lee University. We go up to Lee University. At halftime, the score is 1-0. And one of the players goes up to my assistant coach and says, He's never thought that we could, we could actually win this game. And, and the assistant coach goes, yeah, coach has always thought we had a chance to win this, hasn't he? Yeah, because it wasn't about X and O, it was about who you are as a person, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that idea that, you know, how are we going to react to the situation? That's right. So with that lesson that I think sport has brought me is we are always going to have, we're, if you aren't having failure in sport, then you're not playing correctly. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. You're not trying hard enough. You're not playing at the uh, high enough level. Right. So you're not playing the game, quite frankly. You're not playing the game. Yeah, like you said. So, I mean, so if we can beat uh, so, City with a uh, 19 percent possession in that FA Cup game, yep. that one, that one match will, you know, I'll never forget as a United fan. But yep. like, that's not a game City should have lost, but they did. Right, one yep. mistake. Right. So that, and I, and I've been there. And so, how yep. do we? Re it's what what I've learned through all this is. As a coach, what do we take from each experience as a learning experience? And, you know, what were the, what were the things that didn't go right? And how do we make sure that that doesn't happen again, rather than dwelling on everything we did wrong? Yeah, we, we've got to focus on where we're at and doing what is right. We operate, our brains operate on positive serotonin. Yeah. So we have to put that positive serotonin in our brains to be able to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I, I love that. And, you know, it's something that I think about that we talk a lot about mental health on the show. And uh, in leadership, we, we need to be mentally healthy. And that's such a great principle that you just talked about that we do learn absolutely learn from this game is you can't control what happens to you. Mm -hmm. But you can control how you react to it. And that is so important. And that is such a massive mental health principle as well. And if you're not healthy, and understand yourself, it's, it's very unlikely you're going to react well right. when the, you know, what hits the fan. So um, anyway, all right. So last question, uh, what have you read, watched, or listened to that has informed your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Well, I, I'm, 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 I love 
sports movies, right? Yeah. So for me, you know, I love these movies that are, are made about coaches and, and, the, and the stories of coaches. And so whenever I can kind of have that opportunity to watch a movie, I'm not just watching it for the entertainment value. Mm-hmm. I'm watching it for what else I can learn from it. So you talked about McFarland, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, the, the great story that as the coach, I, the sociological piece, right? The, yep. Absolutely. I have to understand the sociological impact that's happening to my players. I, I look at Coach Carter. Coach mm-hmm. Carter is now talking about kids that think they are privileged and they deserve something. Yeah. You know, and, and how do we, how do we, how does he impart into them responsibility mm-hmm. in that, you know, playing sport is not a right. That's right. I, it's it's it, it's a it's a it's an honor to be able to do that. So you know you you get that. Um, I you know, I'll you know, miracle. I mean you know fantastic movie. Just talking about you know I I I, I always love the you know get on the ice and go again, go again, go again. Now that's yep. not necessarily what we're talking about. Great coaching, but <laughs> but but there was something to that that's idea right. about are you playing for the right badge? Yeah, who are you? Yeah, who are you yeah, playing who, for? Who, who do you play you for? Truly, so the, yep. the message here was the badge. This is why people ask me, why do I, you know, why do I recruit high school soccer? And I go, absolutely, I recruit high school soccer. Yep. I love recruiting high school soccer because high school soccer, I see the kid playing for the badge. That's right. That's exactly right. right. Club yep. soccer, they club soccer, they can care less. They're playing for themselves, yeah, for the most but, part. But high school, I seeing a state championship, yeah, that there's nothing more pure about the game, regardless right. of how good of a player you are. Yeah, playing for the badge. So, That's you know, right. you got that out of miracle. So I think the, these ideas of these great sports stories that are told through uh, to us, it's not just the entertainment value, but what what is that lesson that you can pull out and then apply to your own life and your own coaching experience and your own marriage and your own parenting of what you're going to be doing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, as I'm thinking through that, I can't help but think of Remember the Titans, which I think is my favorite sports movie of all time. But uh, I, I, I got to thinking we need a good, uh, you know, soccer coach movie. You know, like we have these all or nothing specials that we see the documentaries. But I think all I can think of from a coaching perspective is kicking and screaming with Will Ferrell. But I don't think that's necessarily a good model for us, you know. So Not, not quite. No, we need to think of a, um, we need to think of a good uh, a good one, you know, so. Um, but I'm sure there is one out there. Maybe it's in a foreign language that we need to, we need to pull out, but if you know that folks, send me an email. I'd love to, love to know that movie. I want to watch it. So anyhow, all righty, man. Well, thanks again for, uh, I mean, I just thank you for your friendship. Thanks for all you're doing. Thanks for, uh, you know, I've already, what we've been able to do together. I'm excited to, to get it going. Um, <clears throat> said folks go check that out. Coach of the bigger game, but just thank you, uh, Christian for who you are, what you're doing, what you've done. Uh, appreciate you. Yep. Thank you, Phil. All right, folks. Well, thanks again for being a part of the show. It's, you know, as, as these conversations go, sometimes, man, we just keep talking. So thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for being a uh, part of the conversation. And as I said, you know, go check out Coach of the Beer Game. Go check out WarriorWaySoccer.com just to see what Paul and Marcy Jobson are doing uh, through their Warrior Way camps and their uh, Warrior Way gives. Uh, as well as the consulting stuff that, that Paul's doing. Check that out. And, uh, you know, you know, Paul's a, a great dude who's doing great things. And Marcy is uh, more than just someone sitting behind the scenes. She is an amazing woman doing incredible things and always has. So, folks, with all of that, I hope that you're taking all that you're learning from this show and you're using it to help you be a better parent, to be a better spouse, to be a better friend, be a better coach, and to continually remind yourself that co- soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks again. Have a great week.